Good afternoon and thank you to everyone joining us on Zoom as well as those watching live on Facebook and Twitter. My name is Jonathan Coby and I'm the State Director of Protect Our Care here in North Carolina. Since the 2016 election, Protect Our Care has been speaking out and fighting back against Republican attacks on our health care. In September, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and President Obama helped launch Protect Our Care's Your Health, Your Vote Tour to make sure voters know that this year, now more than ever, health care is on the ballot. Protect Our Care has held events in 12 key swing states, including today's in North Carolina. Protect Our Care is very excited to bring together today uh, important local voices, elected officials, and candidates to highlight the impact of Trump's failed coronavirus leadership, Republicans' ongoing war on pre-existing conditions, and their failure to protect our health care and lower the price of prescription drugs. This is the third national tour event that Protect Our Care has held in North Carolina this election cycle, and it is easily our best lineup. Joining us today are Protect Our Care Executive Director Brad Woodhouse, Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate Cal Cunningham, North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein, Congressman G.K. Butterfield, Pat Timmons Goodson, Ronnie Chatterjee, and Stacey Staggs. To get our event started, I'm going to hand things off to Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jonathan, and thank you to Brad Woodhouse for all of the work that you do uh, on behalf of Protect Our Care. Uh, not only are you representing your organization, but you're representing a lot of Americans who are uninsured. And so thank you, thank you so very much. It's good to see my fellow panelists today, uh, Justice Timmons Goodson and Ronnie Chatterjee and, and Cal Cunningham and the Attorney General Josh Stein. Thank you, it's good to see all of you and to see that you are well. But most importantly, thank all of you for joining this very important call uh, this afternoon. You know, every person wants good health. Uh, that's a given all across the globe. E everyone wants good health and everyone wants access to health care. And the truth is that every person wants someone else to pay for their health care. Uh, and as, as I say all the time, rich people are fine. They purchase their health insurance, they pay the deductibles and co-pays and they try to stay healthy. Uh, for millions of workers, employers pick up the tab. Uh, for the employee's health insurance. Uh, but for poor people, low-income people, they don't have the luxury that many of their neighbors have. You know, I was on the committee and still am on the committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, the, the Health Subcommittee. Uh, I was on the committee that wrote the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I remember it so well. Uh, when President Obama was first elected and taken, uh, he took office in 2009, the first thing he said to the Congress was that we needed to rescue the economy. Uh, we were in a recession and we did that. The second thing we took up was the Affordable Care Act and it was a very contentious debate, but we were able to pass uh, the Affordable Care Act. In that law, uh, we provided a sensible solution to assist those Americans within 138% of the federal poverty line. Federal subsidies uh, were made available to moderate income people and, and the less income people had, then the more subsidies they were provided. Uh, but also in the law, and this was something that I, I worked on individually, and uh, that was my uh, concentration in developing the law. I worked on Medicaid. Uh, we created a model. Uh, we thought it was a good model for expanding Medicaid. Uh, 39 states expanded their Medicaid program. Uh, we, we found that uh, when the, the uh, Medicaid was first enacted back in 1965, there was one demographic uh, that was omitted from coverage under Medicaid, and that was low-income single childless adults. And that's the demographic that we wanted to include. And so we, we wrote the law in such a way uh, that would include this missing population. And we told the states uh, that if you would ex expand your Medicaid program, that we would pay eventually 90% of, of the cost of the program. In the beginning, it was 95%. But eventually, we would always pay 90% of the cost of reimbursement for Medicaid. We thought it was a pretty good deal. Uh, we, we provided a, uh, some incentives for the states to expand Medicaid. Uh, we, uh, we told the states that if they did not expand Medicaid, then we reserved certain rights to uh, uh, a certain remedies to, uh, to kind of force them to do it. And, and we, but we really wanted it done. Uh, that was challenged, that the, the, the law was challenged and the US Supreme Court uh, sided with us in, in most respects, but in one respect, uh, we lost out in the court. And that was, we could not compel the states to expand their Medicaid program. It had to be voluntary. 
uh, but the 90% reimbursement rate was upheld and all of the other provisions upheld as well. And so you know what, 39 states uh, have now expanded Medicaid, uh, including the state of Indiana where Vice President Pence was the governor at the time. And so uh, Republicans have just, for some reason, disliked the Affordable Care Act from, from the very beginning. Uh, they've done everything within their power to dismantle this law. Over 60 votes, over 60 votes in Congress have, have been offered and, and they have all failed. And now they're in the Supreme Court. Uh, a federal circuit eliminated the individual mandate and now the Republicans are contending that the whole law is, is unconstitutional. And so that's what we are faced with right now. Uh, President Trump and Senate Republicans are racing uh, to install a justice onto the Supreme Court in order to strike down the Affordable Care Act and destroy life-saving protection for people with pre-existing conditions, including people who were infected and are infected by the coronavirus. And you know, the Supreme Court hearing is now uh, uh, behind us and now it looks like the vote will take place uh, very soon. If the Republicans get their way with, with this lawsuit to strike down the ACA, tens of millions of Americans will lose their health insurance and insurance companies will raise rates for millions, millions more right in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, preventive care will be gone. Pre-existing condition protections will be gone. Medicaid, Medicaid expansion gone. Charging women more will be gone. Uh, there is so much at stake in this election. And so I call on, on uh, the Republicans to abandon this lawsuit. Uh, they, are, they are dead set on repealing and, and they don't have anything to replace it with. They're dead set on repealing uh, and dismantling the Affordable Care Act. And what happens then? Millions of Americans will not have access to health care. That's not the way uh, we should conduct business uh, in Congress and in the United States of America. Thank you so very much for having me today. Thank you so much, Congressman. Our next speaker is Pat Timmons Goodson. As the Congressman mentioned, she is a uh, former uh, North Carolina Supreme Court Justice, and she is currently a candidate for the 8th Congressional District. And I just want to point out that she is running uh, an incredibly competitive campaign in a district that a year ago, people would have told you that Democrats can't win it. And she is running neck and neck right now with her opponent. Uh, she has really put this race on the map. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to her. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Jonathan. And um, to everyone in connection with the Protect Our Care uh, for bringing us together here. And a uh, hearty hello uh, to uh, Cal and the Congressman and um, our Attorney General and uh, Mr. Chatterjee and just everybody. Uh, good to see you, Brad. Thank you all for taking your time to be uh, with us. I continue, every time I get on a Zoom call, I find myself thinking who's Zooming who. And so um, I'm Zooming you today because we're talking about an issue that is so critical uh, to our citizens. You know, every day uh, thousands of folks try their best to find their way to the United States. They risk their lives. And they're doing that because they're seeking the liberties and the freedoms that we offer. Uh, they're seeking the freedom of speech and to assemble and uh, the right to um, religious freedom and the right to present their um, redresses to uh, our, our government. And uh, they're seeking the, the, the protections and the right of the freedom of uh, the press. Um, but you know, those freedoms don't mean a thing uh, if you don't have your health care. Uh, my 85 year old mother uh, regularly says, if you don't have your health, honey, you don't have anything. Well, I agree with that. If you don't have your health, you don't have a thing. And so I'm so glad to be with you as we're discussing the issue of, of uh, health care, because indeed it is at the top of our our minds as we're dealing with rising costs and of course the global pandemic that represents such a failure of leadership that's made this pandemic worse and more devastating than it had to be or than we could have ever imagined. I've been saying this for a while, but I've also been leading this campaign with healthcare, healthcare and healthcare. When folks ask, what will is your primary focus. What is it that you are intent on doing when you get to Congress? I say healthcare, 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 healthcare times three. Uh, and I was talking about that before the pandemic uh, because it is so much at the heart of everything. 
I tell you, um, for me, it's just unconscionable that we would have citizens that don't have health care. This nation is too prosperous, too rich uh, not to provide such. And to take away health care or the protections for pre-existing conditions before a pandemic was wrong, but to continue that charge during a pandemic is downright sinful. Our campaign has been making health care and the impact of COVID our closing message. Uh, some of you may have seen um, our ad that seeks to connect uh, with folks about the physical, the economic and the mental toll that COVID has taken on so many of us. We've added my wonderful 85 year old mama who I want you to know is now a campaign star. When I go out and ask people to vote for me or to support me, they say, and your mama uh, is too. And so I, um, it, it's clear that our message is getting um, out there because so many of us know the feeling of just wanting to see the faces of our, uh, our loved ones and that that has been extremely difficult during this time. And I'll tell you, uh, the lack of action, the, the lack of a plan to get this virus under control uh, makes me mad. And I believe it angers many of our citizens and angers you as well. The American people are wearing masks. Our frontline healthcare service workers continue to serve our communities. And yet, regrettably, Washington DC can't seem to provide the relief and the plan that we so desperately need. On top of that lack of a plan to tackle COVID, my opponent and too many of his colleagues in Congress are still supporting that lawsuit that would rip away um, and destroy the Affordable Care Act. And they, they still don't have a plan, a real plan for protecting those with pre-existing conditions. And they still, are not pushing to expand Medicaid uh, in our state here. Having said all of that though, I do want to end on a note of hope. Um, the early voting numbers in Cumberland County and I believe around the state are telling us one thing, that people are willing to wait in line to vote for hours because they want to see change. They're not standing in that line to keep the status quo. People are praying with their feet and they're going to the polls because we can't afford another four years of the failed leadership that we're experiencing and with no plan to do any better. We need all of you uh, to keep fighting over these next 15 days we need you to keep talking to your friends and your family. We need for you to text folks. Uh, after you voted, um, make sure you get someone else to the polls. And we're going to be able to do this thing. Our governor uh, will be able to win re-election. We'll be able to flip that Senate seat for Cal. We'll be able to make such progress in our state house and our state Senate. We'll be able to send our incredible attorney general back. And uh, yes, we're going to be able to add uh, to Congressman Butterfield's numbers and flip some more US House seats to include the 8th Congressional District. So thanks so very much for inviting me. And again, I don't know who's Zoom and who, but I'm enjoying it and it's so good to be with you. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, I couldn't agree more. The early voting and turnout numbers we're seeing right now are so exciting. Some of, our, some of us were just talking about that as people were hopping on. Our next uh, speaker is uh, someone who also needs your votes. And that's Ronnie Chatterjee. He's the candidate for North Carolina State Treasurer. Uh, he is uh, an economist and professor of business and public policy at Duke University who previously worked for President Obama on the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Now I'm going to hand it over to him. Thank you, Jonathan, and I feel uh, humble just to be on this Zoom stage with all these political all-stars. Um, I'm a nerd. I've never run for office before, but I will tell you what a nerd knows, numbers. So as your next state treasurer, let me tell you a couple of numbers I think are really important here. One is 70. 70 is the amount of times the Republicans have tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So there should be absolutely 
positively no confusion of what they're going to do if they win this election, which is repeal the Affordable Care Act. Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. And we have to do it. We don't need 70 times anymore. Healthcare is on the ballot. And if they can't do it through the ballot, they're going to do it through the Supreme Court. And you're seeing that play out, which is why they're rushing against all norms and institutional values to confirm a Supreme Court justice. Well, let's tell, tell you another thing, though, that a nerd knows, which is another number. 38, 38 states and the District of Columbia have already expanded Medicaid, strengthening the Affordable Care Act. But North Carolina's fell behind. North Carolina's watched 38 other states and D.C., including some red states, like Indiana, as Congressman Butterfield mentioned, Arkansas, Missouri. These states have already expanded Medicaid, and North Carolina sits on the sidelines because we don't have the right leadership in the General Assembly. That's going to change also on November 3rd when we elect new leaders across North Carolina. The energy that Justice Timmons Goodson has seen around this state, I'm seeing the same thing at early voting all across North Carolina. Now, if we can expand Medicaid in North Carolina, we can cover 600,000 people with health insurance during a global pandemic where people need health care more than ever before. Here's the thing that's changed that's so important for folks to know who are zooming in today. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, the Republicans did the best they could to make it as unpopular as they could. But now, 10 years on, expanding Medicaid and strengthening the Affordable Care Act are popular in North Carolina, and overwhelming majorities of folks, including Democrats and Republicans, support expanding Medicaid. I'm running against someone who's the architect of tearing down health care in North Carolina. But even my opponent, during the debate, is afraid to talk about his position on Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act, despite years of opposing both. That tells you that something is shifting, not just here in North Carolina, but across the country. Now, here's what Medicaid expansion can also do from an economic perspective. Because an economist, I'm thinking about jobs as well. Health systems and healthcare providers and our frontline responders are some of the biggest employers in North Carolina. Strengthening the Affordable Care Act and expanding Medicaid will create jobs all across this state. The biggest employer west of Charlotte, the biggest employer east of Durham, where I sit today, are, is healthcare. And we need to support all of our healthcare systems in North Carolina to make sure that we keep those jobs during a time when the economy is still recovering. Second, think about a company trying to locate North Carolina, hearing that we're one of the only states that hasn't expanded Medicaid, thinking about the Affordable Care Act potentially being in harm's way. Business leaders make decisions based on the productivity of their employees, and you can't be productive if you don't have good healthcare coverage, whether you're a small business or a large business. That's why every single study is showing the economic, the health, and the moral benefits of expanding Medicaid and strengthening the Affordable Care Act. We know healthcare is on the ballot. Everyone on this Zoom call does, but the voters know too. I stood out in a line in Durham near the South Library for two and a half hours as people waited to vote for early voting. And when one woman got to the front of the line, I asked her if she minded waiting for so long. And she said, no, I'm voting like my life depends on it. That's the kind of wisdom that I hear from people in North Carolina every day. And we all need to vote like our lives depend on it, because it does. This election, the stakes could not be any higher when it comes to healthcare. And just like Justice Tim and Gibson thinks about her 85-year-old mom, I'm thinking about my three kids who are about to interrupt this Zoom call right now. They're eight, five, and three. It's their healthcare too. It's their health, it's their country. And if we work hard, if we vote like our lives depend on it, November 3rd, we're gonna have a great victory in North Carolina, a victory across this country, a victory for the health of all Americans. Thank you so much for having me. And Jonathan, back to you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Stacey Staggs. Uh, she is the Director of Community Engagement for Little Lobbyists. Um, you may have seen her last week testify before the Supreme Court um, about her family's health care and what is on the line for her and her children in this election. So now I'm going to hand it over to Stacey. Thank you, Jonathan. I have to... Uh, I have to say, I'm really impressed to be invited to this panel. Every one of you I hold in such high esteem. Uh, and Jonathan and Brad, I so appreciate the partnership between Protect Our Care and Little Lobbyists uh, that helps us share our stories, connect to legislators and, and people who can make that difference for us. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for me to be worried. Um, not the least of which, I'm the mom of twin girls who are each uh, medically complex. They have disabilities that arose from their incredibly premature birth. Um, 
when they were born, they were very small. Uh, Emma weighed one pound, nine ounces, and Sarah weighed two pounds. They were immediately whisked to the, um, excuse me, <laughs> one of my daughter Sarah is here with me too. Uh, but they were immediately whisked to the neonatal intensive care unit and their survival was far from assured. My husband and I spent weeks in vigil, um, learning a new language of medical terms and trying to wrap our head around what the future would look like, incredibly different from what we'd imagined before. Around the summer of 2017, just as I was getting my feet under me, um, I started to see news coming out of Washington, D.C. that uh, this administration and the Republicans in Congress were working hard to overturn, repeal the Affordable Care Act. Not because they have a replacement plan, not because they have anything better uh, or more comprehensive or even cheaper, um, but because they they are fixated on undoing the work of the prior administration. Uh, it seems clear to me over these last three years that cruelty is the goal, um, that if there were real legitimate concern about the lives and safety and health of families like mine, uh, that there would be more details given about whatever this future plan is going to be. Um, withholding that information is unnecessary. Um, it, it, it is cruel uh, and it causes undue stress, uh, particularly, of course, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, my girls are seven years old now. They turned seven in late September and we haven't, they haven't left the house or property in 226 days and counting uh, with no end in sight. They haven't seen extended family members um, they haven't been to school. They haven't been able to go to birthday parties, have play dates, or do any of the things that seven-year-olds would typically do. And that's not because of a botched uh, federal response. This is on purpose. Uh, this is designed to be difficult. Um, <clears throat> and that is why I'm vote. Actually, I've already cast my ballot for everyone who's running, <laughs> who's on this call. Um, it turns out for every Democrat that is, um, that is uh, within my districts that I've had an opportunity to vote for, I certainly did. Uh, and I am bringing friends and family with me to the polls. Um, I wanna share that Little Lobbyists is a family-led organization that does advocacy work for kids with complex medical needs and disabilities. Every family in our network is dealing with healthcare as the priority uh, in our kitchen table conversations. These are the things that keep us up at night. And these are the things that cause us worry and undue stress. The Affordable Care Act has saved the lives of my children and so many more. <clears throat> Before the Affordable Care Act was enacted, there were things called pre-existing condition exclusions where the insurance company could say, for example, if you had a cancer diagnosis, We'll give you insurance, we'll charge you a lot more for it, and we will not cover any of your cancer treatments. There is also uh, a component of insurance called lifetime coverage caps, where if you reached a million dollars, and typically it was a million dollars in claims, uh, you were deemed too expensive and you lost your health insurance eligibility. You could not get uh, health insurance. And families did what families would do they went into dire financial straits and ended up filing medical bankruptcy uh, to, to keep their loved one uh, with the treatment that they need. When I was in the NICU with my daughters, nobody approached me about billing. Nobody told me I need to make this decision versus that because one is more expensive. And when we left the hospital, when I was finally able to bring my girls home with me after four months, we received an explanation of benefits that totaled nearly a million dollars. They crossed a million dollars in claims before their first birthday. And in the last seven years, our family's claim total is over $4 million. When we talk about what the Republican efforts have been to repeal but not replace the Affordable Care Act, 
They're talking about my kids. They're talking about our families and they're telling us we don't matter. We're too expensive. I can't abide that. I need everyone to understand that indeed healthcare is on the ballot. And when you cast your ballot, do so for someone who supports the expansion and protection of the Affordable Care Act, not the people who are trying to take it away. It's not because the Affordable Care Act is perfect. There are improvements that need to be made and that's fine. But to dump the whole entire thing because of the individual mandate is not okay. It can't be allowed. Thank you, sorry, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey, for your story and your advocacy over the past year. Um, I have been honored to get to know you and, and work together with you to protect our care with little lobbyists um, and doing all the healthcare advocacy work uh, that we've been doing uh, throughout this election cycle. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to uh, North Carolina's Attorney General Josh Stein. He has been uh, not only advocating for uh, Medicaid expansion in our state, but he has been joining other attorney gen attorneys general uh, across the United States to fight back against Trump's lawsuit to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Brad. Your leadership on this issue has been immensely helpful. Uh, Stacy, thank you. Your family does matter. Your government should embrace you and your family. They should not be making you or literally the millions of other Americans who without the Affordable Care Act would be left alone. And sadly, too many people would die as a result of that. And the fact that uh, the Republican attorneys general who brought this litigation, the fact that the Trump administration moved sides from defending federal law to the other side of the courtroom to attack federal law and try to eliminate it in its entirety, I think is scandalous, horrendous. It's also unlawful, the, their legal position. They found a judge who sided with them. They found a court of appeals who partially sided with him. And now they've appealed this law, the Affordable Care Act, to the United States Supreme Court. And what they have asked this court to do is to strike down the Affordable Care Act, strike down the Affordable Care Act in its entirety, which means that every single protection that that law affords the people of North Carolina will be gone. So families like Stacy with pre-existing conditions or who bump up against a lifetime cap, there are protections under the Affordable Care Act for families like Stacy's. They will be gone. More than 4 million North Carolinians have a pre existing condition. That means that we are protected against being discriminated against by insurance companies because of that fact. That's how insurance should work, is you shouldn't be able to penalize people who are sick. We need to have a global pool of the entire country and spread that risk out among all of us because all lives are precious and all lives are worthy. So if you have a pre-existing condition, you are at risk of losing those protections. If you get your health insurance through the exchanges and more than a half a million North Carolinians do, your access to health insurance will be lost. If you're one of 400,000 North Carolinians who can only afford insurance because of the subsidies of the ACA, you are at risk of being without health insurance. If you're one of 70,000 young people under the age of 26 who are on your parents' health insurance policy, those protections will be gone and you will be on your own. If you're one of 1.8 million seniors whose prescription drugs are cheaper because of the Affordable Care Act, your drug prices will go up. All of this is real and it's at the US Supreme Court. The case will be argued the week after election day. The, Supreme, the Republicans in the Senate are trying to rush this nominee through in record time she has demonstrated her hostility to the Affordable Care Act. There is genuine risk that they will strike down this law. But whether or not they do, healthcare is on the ballot. We're gonna fight like heck in the US Supreme Court, Democratic attorneys general who are defending this law to keep it alive. 
And let's just say, let's say we win. Somehow we win. We are able to convince five justices that we're right. Healthcare is still on the ballot because you know there are a million North Carolinians who do not have health insurance today. And they deserve health insurance, just like Stacy and her family do. So if, however, they strike it down, it will be desperate that we have Pat in Congress. It will be desperate that we have Cal in the US Senate because they're gonna to have to construct something out of the ashes that the Supreme Court and the Republicans have created. Because one thing we know for certain, the Republican party has no answers on healthcare. They've had more than a decade to come up with a plan, a solution that provides accessible broad coverage that's affordable for American families. And we've not heard the first word. So healthcare is on the ballot. People's lives are at stake. Ronnie talked about the economic impact. It would create tens of thousands of jobs if the state expanded Medicaid here. There are rural hospitals whose entire existence is dependent upon the Affordable Care Act. So I ask the voters of North Carolina to vote like healthcare is on the ballot because it genuinely is. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney General Stein, and thank you for all you do to protect North Carolina's health care. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Cal Cunningham. He is the Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate North Carolina, and he has emphasized since the very beginning that this is a health care election, and he has been dedicated to protecting the Affordable Care Act, expanding Medicaid, and listening to the experts on COVID-19. Cal? Uh, well, first of all, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for uh, your leadership, Brad, for yours in making it clear about what the stakes are. For everybody who's gathered here today, I'm grateful to be on the ticket with you with such a strong group of, of candidates and office holders who genuinely care so deeply about our future and about health care. Uh, Stacy, look, I'm sure that you make Emma and Sarah just incredibly proud, uh, but know also that you make our whole state proud through the commitment that you've shown and frankly, the bravery that you've shown in sharing your family's healthcare story, not just here today, but in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, in the midst of this rushed confirmation hearing. Look, I think all of us can agree that this is by far the most important election in our lifetime. The stakes could not be higher. Attorney General Stein just very, uh, succinctly summarized how health care is on the ballot. We've heard it from several different perspectives here this afternoon. It's politicians like my opponent, Senator Tillis, that are actively working against the health care interests of the people of North Carolina. That's why we know in this race that health care is on the ballot. We're facing extraordinary challenges as a nation, as a state, our communities, our families, that call on us to work together. Uh, just look at the guests that we have here today, Stacy and her family telling her story about the threat to the millions of North Carolinians who live with pre-existing conditions who like Stacy have run up against what would be lifetime limits, fearful that Republicans will finally be successful in their efforts to undo what has been progress over the last decades. Here we are in the midst of this election, knowing that our children can't attend school like they should be able to. We're still waiting for guidance out of Washington, a plan based on science to deal with this pandemic. I have in this race uh, an opponent in Senator Tom Tillis, who's been too weak to stand up to this administration in light of clear failures to respond to this extraordinary crisis. The election is about the millions of North Carolinians with pre-existing conditions who could lose their coverage because Tom Tillis will not stop until he's successful in eliminating the Affordable Care Act, even though he and his party have no plan to replace it. This race is about finally expanding Medicaid in North Carolina, which Tom Tillis blocked, proudly saying that he made it illegal for the governor to expand that coverage to the hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians who could be using it today in the midst of this pandemic. Instead of fighting for our health care, rolling up his sleeves to work on further COVID relief, 
What's Tom Tillis doing? He's standing behind the lawsuit that would invalidate the Affordable Care Act, taking away those consumer protections for those with pre-existing conditions. And rather than passing COVID relief, he's rushing through a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court that's made clear her position that when Chief Justice Roberts upheld the Affordable Care Act, that that was somehow wrongly decided. Yet Tom Tillis calls those concerns, quote, just another political stunt. What? Just one of many, many reasons Senator Tillis needs to go. Look, if we want to keep our families safe and we want to keep our families healthy, we have to think about this election as our one and our only opportunity to course correct for the people of our state, for Stacy, for Emma, for Sarah. But the fact of the matter is, voters are already registering their opinions at the polls in record numbers. It's on all of us to organize our communities, get folks out to the polls, make sure that our friends and our neighbors recognize the stakes, recognize that while it may be the name Cal Cunningham on the ballot, it may be the name Josh Stein or Pat Timmons Goodson or GK Butterfield, really, it's your health care. That's what's on the ballot. Thanks for the opportunity to speak, Jonathan, back to you. And thanks again for all the leadership that you're providing. Thank you so much, Cal, and, and thank you for your uh, leadership and your advocacy for North Carolinians healthcare in this election. Uh, I'm now gonna hand it over to uh, Brad Woodhouse, the Executive Director of Protect Our Care. Great, Jonathan, thank you. And I wanna thank uh, this panel and I want you to know that it doesn't, it doesn't matter because I'm not anybody, but I give my hearty endorsement to every single one of you running uh, for office uh, on this uh, on this panel, it is so important uh, that we that we elect people who will protect the health care of the people of North Carolina and elect people who will protect American health care. And it is so important that we elect Cal Cunningham to the United States Senate. I can't say that enough. Um, it, it it is it is absolutely true that Joe Biden may win the presidency, uh, and got and, and we all hope we all hope that he does. But if we were to win uh, the presidency and hold on to the house with Pat, you going in and representing us uh, in Washington. But if we do not take the United States Senate, we won't be able to do all the things that we all want to do to improve American health care. We'll continue to be in a rear guard action to stop Republicans from trying to sabotage the law. We'll be in a rear guard action uh, to stop Republicans from trying to use the courts to sabotage the law. You got to send Cal Cunningham to the United States Senate if healthcare is your issue in the state of North Carolina. And let me tell you what, if you can't vote for Cal Cunningham, you should vote for a carrot before you vote for Tom Tillis. And I'll tell you what, Cal Cunningham is a hell of a lot more than a carrot, but you would get more, uh, uh, voting for a carrot would do more for your healthcare than voting for Tom Tillis. When it comes to the health and healthcare of the people of North Carolina, Tom Tillis, is a disgrace who has failed the people of, of North Carolina from before he was in the United States Senate, blocking Medicaid expansion, running a Senate campaign uh, against the Affordable Care Act, saying one of his top priorities uh, in, in the United States Senate would be to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And I've heard this diatribe for so long, heard it from Lindsey Graham during the, who's in another tough Senate race uh, in South Carolina, who said this from uh, from the seat of the chairman uh, last week. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has been a disaster for South Carolina. He can't come up with one reason that it's been a disaster uh, for, for South Carolina. And Tom Tillis can't come up with one reason that it's been a disaster for North Carolina. Stacy, they don't have a substantive reason to oppose the Affordable Care Act. They don't have a substantive reason to take away health care, to take away protections for people with pre-existing conditions. It's all politics. They have politicized health care since Barack Obama was president of the United States, and they cannot get it out of their system. Sure, the Affordable Care Act can be improved. Joe Biden wants to improve it. Cal Cunningham wants to improve it. Pat, Ronnie, Josh Stein, we all want to improve it. But ripping it away from people in the middle of a pandemic. And let, let's talk about this pandemic. Tom Tillis has done nothing to help people get through this pandemic. He's done nothing to insist that his Senate leadership take a real role in providing 
COVID relief to the people of North Carolina and the people of America. He has sat there silent as Trump has on again, off again, negotiated uh, a COVID relief package, as McConnell has refused to bring a, a real COVID relief package to the floor. People in North Carolina, unemployed people in North Carolina, small businesses in North Carolina, people who've had COVID in North Carolina, people who are treating people with COVID in North Carolina have all suffered because Tom Tillis and Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump cannot get their act together and do what's right for the American people. And now, after all that, and after going and catching COVID himself at a super spreader rally at the White House, after doing that and then showing up uh, at the J Judiciary Committee hearings, barely after enough time to get that out of his system. After all that, they're rushing a justice onto the Supreme Court as an insurance policy that they'll have the votes to get rid of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. They could do this vote in November. They could do this vote in December. The key uh, calendar item for them is not November 3rd. It's November 10th the day the Supreme Court would hear oral arguments. They want to make sure she hears those arguments so she can vote in favor of them. Tom Tillis tried to destroy American health care on the floor of the Senate. He failed. And now he and Donald Trump are trying to do it in court. You know, I, I, I love Congressman Butterfield. I wish he was still on the line. He said, you know, I call on Republicans to withdraw this lawsuit. I mean, Stacey, we have called on Republicans to do the right thing. We have implored Republicans to do the right thing. We have lobbied Republicans to do the right thing. We have shamed Republicans and uh, tried to shame Republicans in doing the right thing. It's too late. They will not do the right thing. They cannot do the right thing. The only solution is to vote them out and vote Pat in and vote Ronnie in and reelect Josh Stein and make Cal Cunningham a United States Senator that when it comes to your health and your health care, every North Carolinian can be proud of. Jonathan. Uh, Brad, as our next president, Joe Biden might say, God love you. Thank you for uh, your advocacy uh, and your passion. I was a little worried that your fist might uh, smash through <laughs> there. Uh, but, but I'm thank sorry, you. I'm worked up. I'm worked up. <laughs> Uh, we, we know, and you are the reason we're here, so thank you for uh, everything that you do. Uh, I do want to, um, while we're on the topic of Tom Tillis, I do want to um, uh, flip us back to Stacey Staggs for a minute or two, who uh, sent me a message after she, she spoke and wants to talk a little bit more about her uh, testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. And I apologize I didn't get into that wonderful uh nerve-wracking experience uh, from last Thursday, but if I can share just a few uh, thoughts about that. Um, I will say that I never imagined that I would be invited to provide congressional testimony. That's not a typical thing for me. Uh, and the rest of my day was very normal. It was filled with laundry, dishes, and schoolwork. Um, <clears throat> but I mentioned before that since 2017, when the when Congress has been working to repeal the Affordable Care Act, I have been reaching out to Senator Tillis's office. I was initially under the assumption that he must not know, he must not understand the true impact of what they're talking about. Uh, and if I could just get some time with him and his office, either here in Charlotte, or I've also done tried to get connections up in his office in Washington, D.C. If I could just sit in front of him for a few minutes and have these conversations, it would certainly change his mind. It's the only decent thing to do. In my numerous outreach attempts, I have been met with basically silence, uh, although I have gotten a few form letters, uh, nothing that equates to a meaningful response. He's not interested in hearing from his constituents and that has been true for the duration of his one term. Even when I was able to uh, address the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Tillis left the chamber in the middle of, of the hearing. When there was a follow-up question asked to me by Senator Coons of Delaware, um, I immediately asked if Senator Tillis was still in the, in the chamber because that's the only chance I'm ever gonna get to have some time with him and he left. He was an empty chair, just like he has been for the entire six year term. And I don't think that's right. And I know that that's not how Cal Cunningham is going to conduct himself. 
he's already reaching out to constituents, potential constituents uh, on all types of topics. That I mean, you heard him, <laughs> I'm so proud. Uh, he knows my daughter's names. Uh, he's heard our story. He, you know, personalizes it, recognizes it, wants to do the work to help the people of North Carolina. And that's never been true for Senator Tillis, so unfortunately, because people are suffering, people are dying and it's not okay. The same is true as, as Brad mentioned, the same is true about this uh, SCOTUS nominee. Amy Coney Barrett has already told us, not during the hearings where she declined to answer any meaningful questions, but before in opinions she's writ written uh, in her, her judicial capacity, she is hostile to the Affordable Care Act, which makes her hostile to the lives of my kids. And they picked her on purpose for that. You have to know that. Uh, if you saw, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Whitehouse's review of what he called the scheme, um, there are conservative donors who are not only uh, funneling and orchestrating cases and amicus briefs, but also putting money into nominations that they believe will bring about the result that they want. None of this is accidental. None of this is the luck of the draw or timing uh, coincidence. This is all on purpose and it's all meant to undermine the Affordable Care Act, to, to overturn it and to leave this country in chaos. I'm in a position now where I have to hope we survive this administration. I have to hope we survive this pandemic and all of the unrest that the administration is sowing across states. If we get to the other side of this with our family intact, it's because we've been able to elect people who care, people like Cal Cunningham and Josh Stein, who's uh, for the attorney general office and Ronnie Chatterjee and Pat Simmons Goodson. We need people who focus on healthcare and are decent and understand that the decisions they make, the votes that they cast have real life consequences that include the lives of my kids. I wanted to share that, Jonathan. Thank you for that chance too. All right, thank you so much, Stacey. And again, thank you for everything that you do uh, to not only for your fighting for your family, but fighting for North Carolinians healthcare. Uh, I'm now going to uh, hand it over to Kelly uh, with Protect Our Care, who will explain uh, the process for questions. We only have time for one or two questions. And I know we've already had some, uh, some voters and uh, constituents who have submitted questions. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to her. Thanks, Jonathan, and, and thank you again to all of our panelists and for everyone who has joined us today on Zoom and on Facebook Live. If you are watching on Zoom and you have a question for any of our panelists, please go ahead and pop that into the Q&A feature in Zoom. It's at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can leave questions in the comments on the live stream on Facebook, and we will do our best to field uh, those questions as they come in. As Jonathan mentioned, we did have one question come in already, so I'm going to turn it back over to him. Sure, uh, so uh, this question comes from uh, Kara. She is a Charlotte resident and lives with multiple pre-existing conditions and relies on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, her question is, should the ACA be overturned, what is the next move? Uh, there are many of us who are feeling very frightened and while our preference would be that this not happen at all, we wanna be ready. Uh, so I think the question there is, you know, what what is the next policy move if the ACA is overturned? And I think uh, uh, any of our uh, candidates can feel free to answer that. I'm I'm happy to take that, Jonathan. If because, uh, well, first of all, Kara, thank you for expressing that concern. It illustrates once again why healthcare is on the ballot, and it's part of the reason that I and and Pat and Ronnie and our Attorney General, Congressman Butterfield are working so hard to make sure that, first of all, the public recognizes the stakes and then that we get voters to polls to vote uh, as if uh, these are the stakes. We have to win these elections over the next uh, 15 days. We have to succeed in making sure that Pat goes to the Congress along with Congressman Butterfield. We need to make sure that in this race that I replaced Tom Tillis in the United States Senate, because if the court were to act and rule that the Affordable Care Act must be struck down, 
it's likely to issue that decision in the spring of next year, March or April. Most people expect us still to be grappling with this pandemic when the court issues its ruling. And I would be asking Attorney General Josh Stein on behalf of the attorneys general to immediately seek a stay of that order to stop it while a new Senate and a new Congress and a new president immediately take action in Congress to pick up the pieces. And I think, Brad, uh, you may have mentioned this, Jonathan, you may have mentioned this. If the Republicans are successful in finally striking down the Affordable Care Act, taking those protections away, over 20 million Americans could lose their health care overnight. So many of our people would lose consumer protections, the young people that are on their parents' uh, insurance policies, all of that is at risk. As a member of the United States Senate, I would be ready to move quickly and decisively to work with my colleagues, work with the House, work with the administration to pick up the pieces, reinstate what protections can be reinstated, moved to uh, build off of and respond to the court. But it'll also require the litigants to step in and see if we can get the court to stop what could be a catastrophic moment for millions of American families. Can I add one thing, Jonathan, in response to this question? And I couldn't agree with you more, Cal, um, that in the event this happens, and let's say Joe Biden is president, and uh, Pat's gone on uh, to Congress, and uh, G.K. Butterfield's reelected, and we have a majority uh, in the House, but we have a Republican Senate. Mitch McConnell, and in that case, maybe Tom Tillis, won't lift a finger to fix what has they don't have a plan they don't care about having a plan and that means that it, it's not i've heard people say well we would just repass it or we would do, do a legislative fix to whatever the court found wrong not possible if you still have republicans running the united states senate that's why this united states senate majority the determination of that is going to come down to the senate race in north carolina if you care about your health care if you care about health if you care about uh, getting past this coronavirus pandemic, send Cal Cunningham uh, care to the United States Senate so he will be there in a Senate majority to fix whatever disaster uh, the Supreme Court uh, may, uh, may give us uh, if they strike down. Well, let me say one other thing about this lawsuit. This lawsuit is without merit. Uh, this lawsuit is specious uh, on, its, on its legal claims. And I, I heard that when it was filed and people say, well, it's not gonna go anywhere because it's so specious, but, but we have a political court now. Let's just be honest. Uh, we, we are on the precipice of having the third justice uh, put on the court that has been nominated by Donald Trump, who has uh, made number one vow of his presidency to take away the Affordable Care Act. So as specious as it is, it's not because there's something wrong with the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's a specious legal argument being pushed by specious people uh, to a court that is, uh, that is dominated by, uh, it, at least on the majority side, Donald Trump appointees if this nominee uh, get, gets, on, uh, gets onto the court. And so a, a United States Senate uh, that's in Democratic hands along with a House that's in Democratic hands and a Biden presidency can fix what the Supreme Court uh, may do. Uh, but first we have to put Cal Cunningham uh, in the United States Senate and make sure that uh, Mitch McConnell is no longer uh, the majority leader. All right. Thank you, Brad. Um, I don't see any more questions in the, the question and answer box uh, that, that folks were able to submit to. Um, and I know some folks uh, have other commitments at two o'clock. I do want to acknowledge um, Congressman uh, G.K. Butterfield, as well as um, Attorney General Josh Stein, who both had to uh, hop off early. Um, but I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Cal Cunningham, Brad Woodhouse, uh, Stacey Staggs, Pat Timmons Goodson, and, and Ronnie Chatterjee. Um, this is a uh, healthcare election. And in 15 days, well, right now, uh, people are voting right now. In 15 days, uh, you know, on election day, healthcare will be on the ballot. Uh, that'll be our last chance to get out there and, and vote. Uh, to protect North Carolina's health care. And as I believe Cal said earlier, you know, you will see all these names on the ballot. You will see Cal's name. You will see uh, Ms. Pat Timmons Goodson's name. You will see Ronnie Chatterjee's name. But it's your health care. It's your family's health care that uh, we are fighting to protect. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us and uh, have a great afternoon.